How many of you have heard the old ancient proverb, you can't have your cake and eat it too? Anyone? It's a very interesting turn of phrase. It's basically trying to say, you know, you can't have your way all the time. You can't have everything. But when you really look at it, it's actually something much deeper. It's actually something quite deep because it's kind of saying... Don't you have to have cake in order to eat it, right? You can't eat cake if you don't have it. But at the same time, doesn't cake stop being cake if you can't eat it, right? Is it actually cake if you can't eat it? It doesn't matter what the boundaries of edibleness are or if it's inedible, is it even cake? Rochelle has gotten incredible at making desserts. So now when anyone invites her anywhere, they're like, would you just bake something? Could you imagine? My God, amen, this is a holy Sunday. (laughs) Could you imagine you're posting an event and you ask somebody, would you mind bringing the dessert? They're like, I got you. And they bring the most decadent, incredibly, I mean, they're, they're walking in and you're like, I'm an adult. I don't have to eat dinner. I can ruin my appetite all I want. I'm going to go right to the dessert because I can. Take that, mom. Um, And then she's like, hey, they go, where do you want me to set it up? And you're like, right over there on the dessert table. And they go, no, 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 no. You see, these these aren't meant to be eaten. These, this is just more for show. You remember that like one living room that you're just not allowed to ever go in? (laughs) Can you imagine having dessert that you weren't allowed to eat? It's not dessert at that point. They didn't actually bring desserts. You see, what this phrase is actually trying to say is there's a weird relationship between things. There's an interesting relationship. Yes, God. (laughs) There's a weird relationship. If you're watching online and you didn't hear that, we did. There's a weird relationship where if you don't have both, they kind of cease to be anything at all. Because in order to actually have, like to eat cake, you have to have it. But once you eat it, you no longer, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. You kind of see this in Hebrews 11. It's, 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 uh, it's interesting uh, I didn't say this in, in any of the other messages, but it says with, in verse 6, without faith it's impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. But here's the thing, you, you may think those are two separate things, but they're not. If you don't have both, you don't have one. I can't believe that God exists, but not also believe that he rewards those who seek him. Because you see, here's the crazy thing. To serve any God other than the actual God is idolatry. So if I believe God exists, but I don't believe he's the type of God who rewards those who seek him, then I actually don't believe God exists. In the same way, to say I believe he rewards those who seek him is to say I believe he exists. You see, there's these two things. It's they, they are, if I don't have both, I don't have either. The last couple of weeks, we've been doing a series on the thoughts. It kind of stems from the book I just wrote, Clickbait. Win the war for your mind in the age of distraction. I just, this is a personal project for me, something I was working on. And as Pastor Steve, Pastor Mary dove into it, they thought, you know what? This is what we need to be discussing. And so we've been discussing clickbait adjacent material just on, on the war for our mind. And you will not find a sermon, a book, or a blog, or anything about your thoughts and your mind without 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It doesn't happen. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ. King James Version says, bringing every thought into captivity and the obedience of Christ. 
You see, when you look at that, you think for a second that there are two different things written out. You, or maybe you think it's just like one, eh, you know, we preach so many messages on taking every thought captive. We write so many books on taking every thought captive. But we really don't talk enough about bringing everything under the obedience of Christ. And this is where I say there are two separate things in this verse. And very much like you can't have your cake and eat it too. Both of these things must exist for any one of them to exist. Let me ask you this, okay? On this side, taking every thought captive, there's the idea that we have taken a hostage, that we have grabbed a thought and taken it hostage. And then on this side, we have this idea of being obedient to Christ. You and I, for whatever reason, believe obedience is more like a dog on a leash or a child being obedient. They listen to the things we tell them to do. But let me ask you a question. Have you ever, ever seen a disobedient captive? Have you ever? <laughs> no? Yes. Sure. Those are the options. <laughs> the truth is, there's also, and I know, I know I'm kind of beating this over, you know, beating it a lot, but like, it's the same thing. There's no such thing as a disobedient captive because just because you lock up a captive, if they're not obedient, they're not really in captivity. You may have locked them up, but until they actually submit, the Greek for 2 Corinthians 10 actually speaks less of obedience in the child, dog, pet type thing. And it actually speaks more of submission Submission gives you the image of I can walk my dog without a leash because it's going to stay where I've told him to stay. I don't have to tell him again. They're submitted. I have watched in a home, I have watched a dog mistreat every single person in that home until the head of the household walks in. I've watched, literally, I have watched a dog going crazy only to hear the voice of he that it's submitted to, boom, and it's in its kennel. Have you seen those people who are like, cage, and they're like, Pfft. and the dog is in that cage? Like, why didn't my dogs ever do that? There's a difference between being obedient and being submitted. And the word is actually telling us to take every thought captive to the submission of Christ. Have you seen those shows? Of course, none of us have ever seen Game of Thrones because we know the Lord, but I, I, those types of shows, those types of shows where there's a dungeon and there's war and, you know, there's hostages, there's prisoners of war. Or maybe you've seen the Marvel movies like Thor when they take Loki captive. There's always that moment when there's like a disobedient captive where somehow they're contained but the, the protagonist is still looking, saying, why do I feel like you're happy you're here? Even though we've contained you, they're still somehow in control. I read the story this morning of a, of a bad prison break. A, a husband met with his wife during one of the visits, and he told her, you need to start taking helicopter flying lessons. I'm going to, apparently there were quite a lot of nectarines in the cafeteria, and he painted one to look like a grenade. So he was gonna scare everybody into thinking he had a grenade. She was gonna fly a helicopter in and take him out of there. It didn't work. <laughs> they didn't realize how long it took to actually land the plane or land the helicopter, so by that time they were both caught. But <laughs> you can look at this prisoner and know they're not gonna stay a prisoner for long. Have you ever seen that kind of situation in a show or a movie? See, that's not a prisoner at all because they're not submitted. Meanwhile, there are other shows, other movies, where they have taken somebody hostage, but they've trained them to such a way where they basically start to act like family. They don't ever have to be locked up. They're not going to run. Have you heard the stories of people who have been taken hostage and bought into Stockholm Syndrome so much that they're actually not even trying to get away? This is how 
we act with our thoughts. We thought we took this prisoner captive because we found ways to not think about it anymore. It doesn't control me anymore because I don't think about it anymore. Or I've met with a counselor about it, and so now I have a list of things I have to do whenever that feeling starts to come. And what we don't realize is really all we've done is lock that prisoner away. But they're not going to stay there for long. They're not going to stay there for long. We've all watched people just beat the addiction and it comes right back. The Bible speaks of this itself. It says, you might kick that strong man out, but if you don't fill it with something better, that strong man's coming back. You see, if you don't actually take the thought captive and bring it to the obedience of Christ, you didn't do anything. All we did was send it to timeout. Now, here's the thing. The word says that Jesus is the fullness of the word. Hebrews 11 said that God created everything through his word. 2 Corinthians 10 says that you and I must bring every thought to the obedience of Jesus. Jesus is the fullness of the word. God created everything through the word. Jesus is the word. I have to bring everything through the obedience of Jesus. What does that mean? I'm trying to, be, trying to pull it all together for you. What does that mean? I have to know the word to know Jesus. And I have to know Jesus if I'm going to bring every thought captive to Jesus. This is why... I told you, this is about more about works today than it is faith. We talk a lot about what we should believe because we're Christians. We don't talk nearly enough about what we should do because we're Christians. You have to be in your word. You have to read your Bible. I know it seems so cliche for a preacher to say, read the Bible. But you know what happens when you as a Christian come to church on Sundays and do not read your Bible? Can I tell you what happens? Look, this is for real. We get the best version of you and you get the worst version of you. Because every time you show up, so many people say, I come here because I feel good when I'm here. They deal with anxiety or depression or whatever it may be, worry, doubt, fear. But when they come here, they feel so good. That's because when you come here, you put all of that on time out. You speak to these, just your presence here speaks to all that. They literally can't come in here. They can't. Do you know before you walked into that lobby, we prayed in there? Do you know five days a week at 6.30 our team wakes up and prays for you? Before you get here, I'm telling you, it can't come with you, but here's what it can do. You may send those thoughts, those negative emotions, those feelings to time out, and they don't mind. They don't mind because they know they'll meet you back in the car. They know they'll meet you back in the car. So you know what that means? Look at me. You know what that means? That means we get the best version of you and you don't. That's not fair to you. We get the version of you that's not burdened, that's not depressed, that believes, that has joy, and you get the version that's sick and sick and sick of being sick. That's why... You have to get in your word because you'll never renew your mind one Sunday at a time. You won't. What prisoner would walk into your prison for an hour and a half and then walk back out and enjoy the rest of his week? Can you imagine if we did that to murderers? Here's what you're going to do. Guilty. 15 years. One hour a week. And you better think about what you've done during that one hour. You see, your word and your knowledge 
of the word allows you to take every thought captive and bring it to the obedient of, obedience of Christ. If you don't do that, only you and those who are affected by you suffer. You see, when we just say, I'm not going to think about things, I'm not going to deal with things, I'm just going to put that out of my mind, really all you've done is locked up the bad guy at the end of the dungeon and decided, I'm never going there. It's all you've done. But you can't starve depression. You can't starve anxiety. You can't starve a lie. I said this a couple weeks ago and like no one like said anything about it, but I think it's crazy profound. The enemy can't kill you. It can't strike you with sickness. The only time in all of scripture, recorded scripture, that we actually hear of him doing this, he had to get God's permission. Do you know every single time, this is crazy, this will blow your mind, every time a city is destroyed, it was the angel of the Lord who did it? The angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Jesus. Jesus is all loving and grace and Pinterest and great. He was destroying cities. The devil can't destroy a city. This is why it's profound when David says, the Lord gives and takes away. Not the devil. So here's what I think is profound. The only tool in the tool belt of the enemy is a lie. Which means you can't starve out a lie. Feel free to lock that stuff up in the corner dungeon. But if you're afraid to approach it, that shows it's not submitted to you, you've submitted to it. I say it in my book, but the truth is we're supposed to take every thought captive, but in reality, we're taken captive by every thought. And we're brought into the obedience of it because when we say you can have life, you say you don't know what I've done. Like something doesn't apply to me That's the thought keeping you on a leash saying, oh, no. You seen those people with dogs? They go, oh, can't go too far. Oh, no. These thoughts will let you go to church. They just won't let you believe church. They'll let you give, but they will not let you reap. And I know, y'all, sometimes you're more caught up in like, other people are really excited about this message. I hope you honestly realize this is about the works you do, not the works of the person next to you. Who cares if there's a loud section? I love it. Because too many of us, too many of us let the lies be way louder than the people next to us in church. That's all I'm saying. Y'all, if we're preaching the word and you're thinking thoughts counter to it, you have been taken captive by a thought. What's cool about this service is I can take my time a little bit. So here's what we have to do. The first thing is you've got to get into your word because... Without getting into your word and knowing your Bible, and listen, y'all, get into a connect group. We'll help you with it. Stay after service. You know what I love about a rainy Sunday? You've got nowhere to go. <laughs> Might as well stay. We're going to help. But the first thing is you literally need to know your word. But the second is this, on, like honestly, you need to identify the lie, write it down, draw a line right in the middle of the paper, and write the truth on this side. You may read it, but now I need to apply it. Because you know what's crazy about Hebrews 11? 35 verses. They span a thousand years of the examples. The examples cover both genders, men and women, all ages, young and old. They span all types of people, from prostitutes 
to the father of our faith. They span all different types of scenarios. People who needed things now, like shutting the mouth of lions. People who needed things in the future, like prophesying the exodus out of Egypt. They span old people looking at dead things and professing and receiving life. They span young people whose parents broke custom to make sure they were blessed. It spans every race, every belief system. Do you know, I know they were all Israelites, but they didn't call themselves Israelites. They called themselves Benjamites or whatever, and they fought each other like all the time. So ethnicity was a problem to them, but this this covers all ethnicity. And you know what's crazy about the whole thing? It doesn't say willpower, knowledge, opportunity, gifting, uh, birth, placement. It doesn't say ethnicity or reparations or anything delivered any of these people. It says faith did. Not Oh, they were in a culture that honored women. Trust me, they did not. By the way, quick break. Isn't it crazy that everybody wants to say, my body, my choice, until it's an NFL quarterback with a concussion? They say, we need to protect him from himself. (laughs) <laughs> sometimes when I watch a comedian I wish they'd stop a bit earlier it would have been funnier I'm going to stop this bit right now because you get it it's crazy to me the same people who want to believe logic for one thing want to throw it away for others I don't get it whatsoever that's why you and I can't believe arguments we have to believe the word because even we will do it Back into the sermon. (laughs) It says faith let the walls fall. Faith kept Rahab alive. Moses considered the reproach of Christ greater than the riches of Egypt and Christ didn't come for thousands of years. What? <laughs> I'm 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 blown away by the power of faith. Because I'll tell you right now, if you were to list out your issue right here right now, we'll find someone in the word who beat it. We'll find someone. So here, let's do this. Ready? Let's practice this. Every eye closed. Do me a favor. Close your eyes. I promise no one's taking anything from you. Close your eyes. We're going to identify right now the area that has taken you captive, the thought that has taken you captive. You ready? Where have you submitted for the sake of peace? Our Bible tells us to ask, seek, and knock. So where have you stopped asking? Where have you stopped seeking? Where have you stopped knocking? Where have you settled for the sake of fake peace? That idea that ignorance is in fact bliss. I used to believe it could happen for my kid, but it's taken too long at this point, so I'm just going to give up. Open your eyes. You know, we tell singles one of the meanest things we could ever tell them, right? We tell people who are single, (laughs) when you stop looking, then you'll find them. 
We tell them all the time, when you stop looking. Here's why I say it's mean. Because there's no books written on how to stop looking. And even if there was, if they bought the book, read it, and applied it, that would technically be looking. But we've taken that and we've adopted it into everything. If I lower my expectations, I'll never be disappointed. And so we think certain things are available to married people, but not divorced people. And then we hear things on social media about the effects of divorce, and we take those things like, that's true for me. A guy I respect said, man, when you get divorced, you lose 10 years of your life. It just happens. You just lose 10 years, no matter what. Not that you're going to die early, but you're dealing with it for 10 years. I got to be crazy. You know what? That may, say, that may sound true, but that's not in the word anywhere. Neither is stop looking and you'll find them. Neither is lower your expectations and you'll find them. And you'll never be disappointed. That's never in the word. Our Bible tells us to ask, seek, and knock. So where have you stopped asking? You want to date somebody who believes like you. And you were praying that that person you're dating would finally start coming. Because God forbid you just like find one of the awesome people here, right? Why is that growing? The laughter was growing. It was hilarious. <laughs> and so you just stopped praying for that person. You stopped inviting them. You stopped asking them. I'm going to stop. You know what? Eventually they'll get it on their own. And you know what? There's truth in that. But at the same time, what lie have you believed? Hallelujah. You see, you may think the lie is, well, I don't want to annoy them. But actually, the lie is deeper. If I annoy them, I'll lose them. And if I lose them, I'll never find anyone better. That's the lie. Because if you didn't believe that, you'd dump that sucker and find someone here. I'm just telling you. You have to ask yourself, what is the lie that I've believed? Because you can't bring a thought into the obedience of Christ if you can't even identify the thought that has you captive. So ask yourself, listen, every one of us has well-meaning parents, but well-meaning isn't the truth. So I can't take something my well-meaning parents said and raise it to the level of God's truth for my life. Even if my parents are pastors. And you know how I know that? Because they were the first ones to tell me that. Get Now, here's what I know. In my personal situation, God will never lead me somewhere that's in disagreement and out of alignment with my parents. But that doesn't mean I can elevate truth to say it comes out of any man's mouth if it's not coming out of God's mouth first. So even well-meaning parents, y'all, you and I, do you understand that the call to follow Christ is to forsake everything? We make a big deal, and Alan, get up here before I preach for a year. I'm sorry, guys, I just, this, 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 this really gets me, but The call to follow Christ is forsaking everything. We make a big deal out of the rich young ruler who wouldn't give up his riches, but there are plenty of people who didn't give up their parents. And Christ said, you can't follow me. There were disciples who were like, Jesus, before we go, can I go bury my parents? And he's like, let the dead bury the dead. We make a huge deal out of the guy who wouldn't give up riches. But that's because we probably don't have them. So it's easy to demonize the guy. But we all have parents. Good or bad. We have to elevate Christ and what he says over them. 
good or bad. My parents have hurt me. Okay, elevate God above that and forget what they said. My parents have raised me in the way that I should go. Great. Well, then take one small step over into the full word of God and be thankful you have got parents that honor God but recognize they are not God. Why is it every great athlete, when they finally win the big one, when they hit 62 in a year, get to that mic at the end and said, they said I could never do it. Why do we get so caught up in the stories of the young third grade teachers who looked at Aaron Rodgers and said, you'll never be anything. And we're like, that teacher is so stupid. She was looking at a third grader. <laughs> My gosh. Why is it? It's, it's always, they're never getting up there saying, man, people believed in me. They want to get up there and tell you everyone who didn't. It's because sometimes we elevate things above the word of God and we don't realize that we are taken into captivity and made to be obedient to it. And the next part, verse 6, is really scary and I don't get it, but I understand it a little bit because it says, being ready to, dis to, to punish every disobedient. Here's what I know. When you have been taken captive by a thought, when you try to step out of it, there's definitely a punishment coming. When you try to like, to like get out of the lie and get into the, the truth, there's definitely a punishment. That's because the opposite of the truth operates the same way. It will take you captive, bring you into submission, and punish you for every disobedience. But this is why In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. You know, what's interesting about 2 Corinthians 10 is its context. 2 Corinthians 10 is actually Paul defending his own ministry. Because the church in Corinth were making fun of Paul. They were saying, oh, you know, when he's here, he's a softy. But when he leaves, he writes, you know, hard letters to us. They were basically saying that he wasn't willing to handle it face to face. He'd have to leave. He'd rather break up over text than face to face. And in the middle of Paul defending his ministry, he says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but have power for the bringing down of strongholds. You know what he's saying? I don't have to yell and be carnal to tear down the stronghold when I'm with you. I don't have to scream and yell and manipulate and convince you in a carnal way that what I'm saying is true. He's saying the weapons of our warfare cause me to be gentle because the weapons aren't carnal. But they have power, divine power to, divine, to destroy strongholds. That's crazy to me because he's literally saying, it's not me who does the work. So the burden of communicating this truth doesn't fall on me. So I can sit here and be gentle because I know the very words I speak in the spirit are pulling down every stronghold. So we take captive every thought I don't need a six-step process. I don't need a pill with some chemical to help me balance. I need the Word. And I need to put the Word up against the lie and bring the lie 
under the obedience of Christ. Because here's what's so crazy, right? Every lie sounds kind of true. Well, here's what's crazy. Every single lie you believed, like a prisoner brought under submission, will eventually start to take on familial characteristics of you. Because you brought it unto the submission of Christ. What do I mean by that? Because that sounds crazy. It basically means this. You will watch how God takes what the enemy meant for harm and use it for your good. There's a show where they take a kid captive and he never has to be in chains. They train him to be a part of the family. And the door's open to him. He leaves the city many times and he always comes back. Why? Because he submitted. The things holding you back right now will aid you. They'll be part of your testimony. They'll be the things that you laugh in your heart as people are telling you they're dealing with because they feel like they're completely taken captive and you're like, I remember that. So in the same way that a captive was made to look like family, God will take what the enemy meant for harm and use it for your good, the things that make you shudder will be used to glorify God. So take every thought captive. Bring it under the submission of Christ. Make it obey Christ. Spend time later today, I mean it, writing down and identifying the lie by looking where you've stopped asking, you've stopped seeking, you've just given up for the sake of peace. I've lowered the expectation. Look at those areas and identify the lie. What's the thought that's trying to protect you? What's the thought that's trying to keep you from trying and failing? Write that next to the word because I'll tell you two verses right now that will defeat 90% of what's going on in your mind. You know, it's harder to break out of addiction of lust and all that than ever before. It's impossible to avoid. You write that down, you put a line down the middle, I'll never, I'll never have a clean mind again. You write that down and say, <laughs> take heart, I've overcome the world. Regardless of how bad it gets. I don't know if my kids are gonna have a good future because of what's going on politically. Take heart, I've overcome the world. I feel like I, I, have, I, I don't have enough time to do the things I need to do, yada, yada, whatever. Take heart, I've overcome the world. And the other, Ephesians 3.20, I have to lower my expectations so I don't get hurt. God is the God of the exceedingly abundantly above all you could ever ask or imagine. Those two verses right there will tear down 90%, if not more, because you realize the Father, the God of your life wants to exceed your expectations. Were you blessed today? Come on, pray with me. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And I pray that this simple word turns into works. I pray it falls on a good foundation, good soil today. And in the name of Jesus, we bind every weed trying to choke out the truth. If there's a hard service surface, where this seed has fallen, Lord, I pray you take that hard surface and turn it into a heart of flesh. Let this seed fall on good soil. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey there, if you enjoyed this video from Metro Life, then we have more content for you to enjoy. We've got music, podcasts, sermons, and messages from our team. We believe that relationship matters. And getting to know one another is a key part of those relationships. So get to know us by looking around this channel. Like, comment, and subscribe. And we look forward to meeting you soon.